Hi everybody, how are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing all right. Thanks for asking. Uh, so I'm Mr. Wallingford. I know most of you. Um, this is one of my favorite events of the year. Uh, no kidding. This is a neat opportunity for uh, us to uh, celebrate with some of our esteemed predecessors, alumni, their 50th reunion year. Let's just hear it for that. And this is the fourth time we've done this, and we hope to continue this on in perpetuity. Um, you guys have all met some of these characters, perhaps by seeing their faces in the yearbook. Uh, you collectively compiled a bunch of really great questions, having browsed through the yearbook, or all copies of the Hudson Enterprise. I hope that was a, kind of an entertaining um, uh, activity for you as you browsed through these and said like, oh, I'm, who in here as you were looking through the hubs and enterprises, came across a name or a face that you actually knew? <laughs> Someone came across their grandmother? She has got her wisdom teeth out today. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm sure that uh, our friends and panelists here um, will tell you a lot about their experiences at Hudson High that kind of uh, align or ring true with your experiences and some things that are vastly different from the way you experience high school and some things that are right in line with how you learned about how history unfolded on the national stage and other things that are even suggested by your questions that actually weren't going on in Hudson when they may have been um, uh, going on with um, at least the way you read about it in your textbook. Uh, some of those things that were happening on the national stage just you know hadn't hit the ground here in Hudson yet. Um, so these are our panelists, as you know, uh, uh, when they were about your age year older. Um, and we're going to begin this by having uh, each of our panelists talk a little bit about uh, who they are, where they lived, when they, um, who knows, some of you may actually be living in their houses right now, right? It's very possible, because um, none of them live in Hudson in the house they grew up in right now. Um, so they'll talk a little bit about who they are, where they live, kind of what they did in high school, um, what they do now, and then we'll launch into the questions that you composed. Um, which are in these slides. And when I scroll through those questions, I'm going to ask whoever composed those questions just to stand up and ask the question, please. Um, so I didn't include everybody's in here because we wouldn't have time for all that. I edited it down. Um, and then after that, we'll just have some time for you to ask questions about anything that's on your mind. Sound like a plan? Yeah. All right. So uh, we will begin with... Um, um, we'll start at the end here with Lorene Jean, who, um, whose name I misspelled and she corrected it for me, so thanks. And uh, Lorene will tell you a little bit about her. So. Well, I'm Lorene Jean. I grew up in Hudson. I lived across the street from here. Um, my house is no longer there. Somebody bought it, tore it down, and built five houses. So if you continue down this way, right before Chapin, is Hammond's. It's not Hammond's Way. I wanted it to be that. That was my grandfather's name. Hammond Circle. That's where I lived. But the school wasn't here. This was just a big field. The Curleys owned the big white house, and this was a field, and they grew alfalfa here. Um, and Hudson was a great place to grow up. It was just amazing. We had so much freedom. You know, by the time I was 10, I could take my bike and ride all over the town. My mother didn't, had no idea where I was. She kind of had a clue, but, you know, we just, we had a great, great time growing up in that era. And now I own the frame shop in Hudson at the Rotary, Hudson Art and Framing, you know, right next to the candy store, so I'm sure you've all been near it. You should come in. Um, and that's it. This is me. Hi, my name's Rocky Zena, or David. I've been called worse. But um, I uh, grew up on Hyde Street, 45. Anyone here in that, live in that area? Okay. I loved High Street. It was like uh, Marine said, you know, um, there's just like a, you know, you, you just go out and all the kids would meet at the, uh, where, where the veterinary club, where the veterinary school is now or whatever. And that used to be High Street School. That was uh, first, second, and third grade and fourth. And um, we used to go play ball or maybe people from uh, Marine's area. We'd, Someone would call them up and uh, we'd challenge them to a baseball game or we'd meet at Riverside Park to play football or go down to Milton's Field to play basketball. 
and that, and that it was just a great time. You knew it was time to come home when you heard the five Cal State whistle. Okay, you had to go home then, and you know, if you, if you hadn't eaten earlier, that, that's when you were going to eat. What was the five Cal State whistle? No, that was at the fire station. Well, I know. Okay. You know. okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was just like it was just a, it was testing, uh, just in case there was a there was a fire. Good question. Okay. And uh, so they'd have it five past eight in the morning and five past eight in the evening. I never knew that. Okay, and so just just in case they wanted to make sure that it was working. And that, but um, you know, Hudson is a great place, and it still is a great place. I live here still. I know a lot of people, uh, several people right here, and uh, you know, I wouldn't want it to be any other place. Oh, that's so nice. I'm Diane Long. I grew up in Hudson, and I can repeat what the other two um, finals of, uh, uh, not finals, panelists have said. <laughs> um, uh, it was a great town to grow up in. I lived uh, down Lower Main Street area near Lake Boone, and I uh, used to ride my bike everywhere. I'd ride all the way down to the lake and all around there where Honeypot Hill orchards are, and you never had to worry about anything. Um, and you know now I have seven grandkids and I don't even let them out of my sight but it, it was so different then um, and then I um, so I left Hudson I don't live in Hudson I live on the Cape and uh, I left went to college and really didn't ever come back um, to this town but it's so beautiful here and I think that you're reaping the benefits of um, every, the um, changes that Hudson has made with the beautiful restaurants and everything that the town has to offer. Um, but I went on and uh, I went on to college and then I uh, went to design school and I'm still doing that. I'm still working and um, and I'm very happy with what I do and I uh, love living on the Cape and love to come back here too. I have family here. My mom's still alive. She's 92 and I come and visit her and my sister and it's a great town. <coughs> You're very lucky to be coming from this town. I'm Edwina Rossi, and I grew up across the street in those smaller houses. It used to be called Hearthstone Village. And uh, during the time that these were built, there were many uh, neighborhoods that were built just like that. Small houses that really suited the needs of uh, post-World War II veterans in their extremely large families. Uh, the houses were small. Uh, they might have three bedrooms, one bath, and four kids, so you have six people in a fairly small house. So we were pretty much sent outdoors a lot. And the fact that our parents did say, go out, they never said, go out and where are you going? It's just go out and come back when the street lights are on. And we had that sense of security because our parents had that sense of security. They, they felt that we would go out, we would do what we got to do, and as long as they didn't have to hear about it, it had been a successful day. Um, for me, I went to Hudson High and I was kind of a geeky person. I liked science and math, I was kind of shy. Um, but I didn't know that there was any careers for girls who like science and math. I was not even allowed to take mechanical drawing because that was for boys. I tried to and I got a trip to the guidance office and they said that's for boys. But if the instructor would let you in, you can take it. So I went to the instructor and he said no. And that was it. So I thought engineers drove trains. So I did not become an engineer. I became a teacher, the world's worst. And I only did it for a really short time because I didn't want to do any harm. Um, I remember having my class come upstairs. I'm supposed to be drilling them a math back, so third grade at Felton Street School. And I said, you know, let's do an art project. I'm not in the mood for math today. So I don't think that would have held these students in good stead further down their educational career, so I thought I would walk away from that. I tried many things and I ended up in a very technical field. I'm a, a data analyst and my, my joy of life is getting to move data and make a database go from one spot to another and validate it and make reports. It's like a puzzle every day. So I love what I do and I'm doing it as a contractor for Dell and I don't see this stopping anytime soon. As long as they want me, I'll be there. So uh, we'll turn it on to Hi, my name's Anne Marie. I grew up on Cottage Street. So when I was in high school, I could just roll out of bed and I was at school. So I, I was never late for school though. I went to Packet Street School for six years. 
I still live in Hudson. I still have the phone number that I grew up with. Um, showing my age. Um, I loved school. I'm going to go a different road than them. I'm going to do my high school years. I loved high school. Um, I stayed busy in high school. I stayed busy after high school. I was on a lot of clubs. I was uh, president of the pep club, which is equivalent to your junior booster. Um, I played basketball, which was the only sport then that girls could play. Hudson High had no other sports for girls. I was in the National Honor Society. After school, I went to nursing school, became a nurse, worked 38 years in emergency room nursing. Um, I continue to come back to you guys. I'm the little one in the booth with Mrs. Carter every foot home football game selling tickets. <laughs> I've done that since 1990. I was on the Hudson Booster Club for six years, served as secretary, so I had a son that went to Assabit, my not I graduated from here in 93. So I've continued my roots in Hudson. I love the town, I love the school system, and that's it. All right, so um, I looking through the questions here, and I thought um, one question that uh, Serena and Rachel wrote was kind of a, maybe a nice segue from what you guys are just talking about in terms of um, uh, somewhat of an idyllic local life um, where you're sort of in your bubble and they had a question about sort of the presence of counterculture. Can Sabrina or Rachel stand up and ask this? You guys here? Sure. So in what ways is like the counterculture that was present in the 60s also present in like suburban Hudson at this time? I'll take it. <laughs> we were going to point at Lorene. <laughs> yes, it was. Um, you know, there were hippies, I was a hippie, but I'll tell you, every day I had to come to school in a nice little skirt, with a little sweater, a little top, because I couldn't wear pants, I couldn't wear, I could wear things that were kind of funky, but uh, it was interesting. But it was, it was a counterculture here, and I see the discipline beyond the home. Now, what is that part? I'll tell you, there was spanking when you were growing up. <laughs> and um, there have been times in my life where I miss that. <laughs> my children but it you know it was uh it was not it, it's bad for us in 1968 was like the summer of love but it took a little while to trickle down to us <laughs> right uh all through my senior well, year 67 was the summer of love you were on tour when they had the chicago riots and oh uh, that's true <laughs> <laughs> i wore my hair in rollers and slept on it every night so my hair could be really nice the next day. I wore makeup every day well, all through high school. <laughs> For me, the big change happened when I got to college. I went to UMass after I graduated. I did not bring my rollers. I did not bring my skirts. Uh, it became a whole different thing. And that's when, for me, the counterculture really clicked in in college. But in high school, we had real strict rules here about what we did, how we looked, and how we behaved. And there really wasn't a lot of wiggle room. <laughs> so I know just people didn't. took LSD in kids' school. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I'll tell you later. Uh, no one on this panel. No one on this panel. <laughs> I was such a nerd. I was here. It was here. You know, marijuana was here. Yeah. That was, you know, it was here and it was really, really want to hear about Alcohol was big. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you talk about discipline up in here. And I see it a big change now. If you went home and you said to your parents, Mr. So and so yelled at me today, it wasn't, they didn't run to the school and say, Why are you yelling at my child? You got yelled at again at home. Your accountability when you went to school was to be polite mm -hmm. oh, and yeah. to do what was told. You, you might have to write you. an apology. <laughs> exactly, and I see that's different now. You you know, with your social media and everything, you have, everything's out there, anything goes. The fact that we had to be respectable because if we weren't outside the home, we got it when we got home. We represented our family, so if you did something that embarrassed your parents, it was a much worse thing at home. <laughs> And uh, at JFK, when Mr. Quinn was the principal, if you went down to him, uh, you, you met his paddle. Okay, he had a big paddle, take you in a room, okay, bend over, whap. Well, you know, here's the thing. He was 
very formidable looking. He was tall, he was big, he had dark hair, he had kind of a mean stare. And uh, he told me, later, and you got to sign the pill. Yeah. You know, if you hit by a, he would take people into the room and he would hit the table. Yeah. That's, you never get hit by the table. You weren't bad. <laughs> <laughs> Names have been changed to protect the innocent. <laughs> but he would, you know, th but he was out there. He was like, I will hit you with this if you don't act properly. He also, one time, the hockey bus was acting up and he got them all off the bus and he made them walk in the cold, in the dark. And he drove the bus behind them. <laughs> yeah, slowly. <laughs> well, it was good he didn't go fast. Yeah. But it's, you know, there are things that you just couldn't do now. You couldn't, you know, your name would be in the paper, the police would be at your house, you know, but it was, it was a little different. But Should I answer it. your counterculture <laughs> question? Do you have any other questions? You got a follow up, uh, With that? I have a follow up. Okay. There'll be some time later if you come up with one. Um, so let's touch upon something else that you guys, uh, um, several of you mentioned in your um, opening comments about uh, the role of gender um, in life in the 60s and in Hudson in particular. Um, Sabrina or Monique, can someone ask this question? Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, my partner and I were really interested in all of this. And so my question is, growing up, what was your experience with gender roles and how does that affect your everyday life? I can say for gender roles, it was like I couldn't take mechanical drawing because I was a girl. My guidance counselors, who were my math and science teachers and knew I was very good in those subjects, they recommended teacher, secretary, or nurse for my college goals or my goals going forward. And that certainly did not work out for me. But uh, there was also like I got married very young and that was considered something that was not considered odd. You know, your, your role as a woman was to go to college, but not necessarily get a degree. They had a thing called get your MRS degree. I mean, you met your Mr. Wright at college and got married. I did, but I did get my degree, <laughs> which was good. Um, so there was a different focus on boys going to school and girls going to school. Early on, I, I wanted to be a doctor, and my mother said, they'll never let you in because you'd be taking a spot away from a boy. And I'm like, okay, so I guess I'll be a teacher. <laughs> you know, it was, we were separated. Oh, yeah. Like, we, David and I went to school for 12 years together, and, and the first four, <laughs> the first four, when we went out to recess, the boys had their area and the girls had their area, and you just didn't cry. You couldn't go over there. You just couldn't go over there. And you have to remember that we're talking about the 60s, but we all grew up in the 50s, mm -hmm. which you can picture like the little housewife with a little button down shirt, narrow waist, with a big skirt, and she's waiting at home for her hubby. And that's, life was kind of like, it wasn't like that in my house, but it was, <laughs> it was kind of like that. I mean, those are the images that you saw. You know, if you were looking at any kind of media, those were the things you saw and those, you know, leave it to beaver or whatever. Mm -hmm. Those were the things that you saw that gave you an idea of what life as an adult would be like. And it was, it was hard to get rid of that stuff. It's, it wasn't easy to, to go beyond it. Agreed. We were not only segregated women, boys and girls, we were as far as classes. You had the college kids, mm -hmm. you had the business kids, and you had the home ec and you asked your arts kids. Mm -hmm. And they didn't cross over. If you were in the college prep courses, you didn't take it, you couldn't take any business courses or like right. Right. Edwina said, any mechanical drawing. If you're in the business, you couldn't take the physics. You couldn't take the the AP courses that you guys had. I mean, you guys have so much available to you now, it's unbelievable. But it was even that way that you, you didn't go to lunch with each other. You didn't go to gym class with each other. Right. You just you were always with the college bound kids or the business bound kids. So it was a little different segregated that way as well. I remember being a college kid and wanting to learn how to type and they said, You don't have to learn how to type, you're not in the business. I thing. had the same I experience. Didn't know who the heck they thought was gonna type my papers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had the yeah, same experience. Like we could take what was called personal typing during the homeroom period in the morning. But yeah, but we couldn't take a real typing class. And they weren't uh, electric typewriters or anything, it was just the hand 
changing to. <laughs> I was just the opposite of, of you. I went from um, my junior year, I was in business. No, I said, I, I, want, I want to be a physical teacher. So I, I jumped over. My senior year, I had to take uh, Algebra two and Geometry at the same time, and, uh, <laughs> which was a little tough, uh, especially when the, they didn't, the other, those teachers didn't uh, know, know that I was doing that. So, you know, I, I was getting lost. I, finally, I went, went in and I talked talk to them. And they, they, uh, they stayed, in, stayed with me after school and helped me out in that, mm -hmm. which was great. Did you have Mr. Sullivan for that? Uh, no, I didn't have Mr. Sullivan. I loved him. <laughs> so, uh, he was great. Mr. Wallenberg, I, I have a couple of follow-ups on that. So that um, lunch, um, like women and men, was that a rule or was that something that just happened? Oh no, that wasn't. No, it wasn't lunch. Was it, or, in high school, sorry, it wasn't lunch. Recess, 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 recess was in the was younger years. Yeah. Was that so? Was that a school yes. policy? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. how Pass yeah. Street was. <coughs> the girls had this little spot under the trees, and the boys had all the rest to play, yeah. and you couldn't cross. No, I couldn't go over there. And then you had mentioned cool. something, uh, Ms. Lopez, about. Um, basketball being the only sport for, for women. Correct. Were there other schools that had more sports for women or was that was Hudson behind on that? Was or is that was it just basketball? You know what? I can't really answer was that. that. Uh -huh. no, 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 nothing. The recreation town was cheerleading and there was basketball. Cheerleading, basketball. cheerleading major and major ends. Yeah, major ends and everything. But uh, and there was no soccer anywhere in Hudson. Mm -hmm. The Portuguese, the Portuguese club. Club. Yeah. 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 but not for the. Yeah. Not for the <laughs> that's where I learned it was. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, let's stick but with you the, know, um, we didn't feel that we were missing out on anything, right. though. I mean, it, it, it sounds like it was drastic, but we didn't really. Mm -hmm. we Girls didn't. weren't supposed to sweat, so it was kind of. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> to be with the boys, it's ready. <laughs> Let's stick with the with the social um, sort of component. Um, what? Actually, that's not the one I want. <laughs> sorry, sorry, How does it feel to see a question just fly right yeah, there? <laughs> Is he going to pick on you? Uh, I've got a question here from Dan and Jeremiah uh, about diversity in Hudson. I don't know where that slide is. Yeah, thanks. Dan, Jeremiah. Was there any diversity in Hudson in the 90s at the time? They were looking through like yearbooks and things like that, and they noticed that it, there was not a whole lot of um, race diversity going through the newspapers and the, and the um, yearbooks. So they had the question, was there any diversity at Hudson High back 50 years ago? I would, my opinion would be no. Um, we didn't have, we had the Portuguese, and we had a few, uh, families from Puerto Rico, my ex-husband being one of them, but otherwise it was white. But we didn't, it didn't play on it. If we if we got a, 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 a child of different color, we would we call them black, I don't know what you guys call them today. Um, we didn't notice that. We, it, we didn't notice that. They were like they were, blind. They, you know, <laughs> we had some special needs kids in our class. Yeah. We, didn't we didn't notice, notice that. that. They were part of it. They did was, everything. Everybody was welcome. I don't number. remember. Mm -hmm. There was bullying, um, which I don't remember, but I am part of our planning committee for our 50th, and there was a group of 15 of us, and I asked them that. Were you bullied in high school? And I was surprised two or three of them were. Um, so I suppose there was some things that way, but as far as color, if you're speaking strictly color, it was. It, it wasn't my opinion. Right. <laughs> I was from when I when I did my student teaching. I don't know if that. Was, sure. If you want. I I did my student teaching in Pompano Beach, Florida. Two thousand uh, students in the uh, school, uh, and uh, they had barbed wire all around the campus because they had the year before they had race riots and so on, and. Uh, uh, I remember one day I was, we were in, 
all, all the it was the basketball court was held held three thousand people, and uh, yeah. one day we were all all the all the kids were in the gym because of it was, it was raining, and one of my students uh, went over to get a drink. He, he was African American, and I, I saw this this teacher come over and push him out of the way. And let the white kids go. And, uh, I was shocked. I just went over and I, I took took my uh, my student. I said, "Come here. You did nothing wrong. You just walk away. You just walk away with me." But I mean, I was shocked that anything like that was happening at that time. And uh, I hope that doesn't happen. I hope you haven't uh, seen that before. Here. Our exposure came after we left Hudson or when we went to college because we didn't feel that here. A question here. Um, I feel like every year people have a question about cars and consumers. And who wrote this question? Um, Ryan or Andre? Yeah, can you ask that? But so I said question as soon as you know about consumers and how people were influenced by certain products. I wonder how that would extend the cars or like certain models. Can you talk about car culture and just like the amount of stuff you had growing up? Whatever was cheap. <laughs> you could buy a brand new Volkswagen for like eighteen hundred dollars, and I think Mark Medici—I can't say his last name—Dimitri Dimitri and bought one, and he was like, "That was very, very cool." Um, but we didn't have a lot of money. You know, it's, this was not a wealthy town. No, but in in the larger world, cars were everything. You know, see the USA and your Chevrolet. All the programs that we watched on television were usually sponsored by cars. Mm -hmm. You know, Bonanza. Or I remember seeing ads for the very first Corvette when it yep. came out. Or so there was a lot of we had a lot of car knowledge, and there were cars were a lot easier to work on then. So you could get a car, and you could work on it and soup it up and make it whatever you wanted it to be without you know didn't have a computer, it didn't have a lot of funny parts. It was just, you know, a little piece of machinery. I once been fixed the linkage on my gas pedal of my 62 Corvair with a ponytail elastic. <laughs> and I kept it that way until I sold it. So <laughs> they were easier. You can see the parts. It was like real screws and nuts and bolts and that kind of thing. Not computers <laughs> attaching anything. That's cool. <laughs> what about um just generally what Stuff cost back then. Um, how much stuff do that? I feel like we have more stuff now. Well, the house cost four thousand dollars. Yeah. A yeah. brand new one in the neighborhood. My parents paid seventeen thousand dollars for a, a house in nineteen fifty nine. I think it was maybe nineteen sixty, and that was huge. That was a lot of money. Yeah. I bought my first house for twenty six five. In 1976. Can can you guys think of something that is um, something that you guys would have bought as a as a high school student that maybe it would still be bought like just so they can get a price understanding of like yeah. how like a yeah how, how much was a gallon of gas? Was thirty two cents a gallon. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I, and Ruthie told me today she said I remember paying twenty five. So McDonald's hamburger ten cents. Yes, <laughs> but, but of course you had to go to like far away to get one. Framingham. Yeah, we would go. There were there were two places where you could D and M and Webster's. You could buy sneakers. Yep. And if they were warehouses, they were wood inside, dusty, dirty. Two dollars. And we would go and get a pair of sneakers. And the sneakers were Keds yep. or <laughs> PF Flyers. PF yeah. Flyers. Yep. They were seconds. And, but but thus we just go and get sneakers. It wasn't we didn't know from sneakers there were any fancy sneakers like kids were fancy sneakers to us. You know we go and if they were they weren't ten dollars right no, no they, two they, dollars at, at yeah. Webster's and yeah and they the were, thing you had to count was the eyelids because sometimes you might have four on one side and five on the other you know so you had to kind of look which one they gave you for a second. But and I remember coming home with a pair. Well that was probably in the fifties but like it was the first day of summer vacation I had my new sneakers on. I was, Running, I felt like I could fly. 
But it wasn't. We were just satisfied. Yeah. The only thing was, like, we had to wear dresses, so you had to have a, a certain number of outfits that you could rotate. And we didn't buy a really expensive store. So if you had money, you went to like the Goldens or something like that. But we, most of us, we sewed. I sewed dresses. You could sew a dress for like three dollars. It was uh, just get what you could get. But the style mattered. So if you could make it look like a style, that was great. But I don't remember there was a lot of things people had that I coveted that I wanted no. to save up for. Right. No. No. No, a transistor radios, I mean, you know, came into being when we were uh, color TVs. Yeah, color TVs. <laughs> oh, when your family got a color TV, you were living yeah. large. Yeah. How much did that cost? Uh, oh, I don't even probably a lot because they, when anything came out, it was very expensive by the by the standards of that day. So to get a color TV was a very expensive thing. Now you can go to Walmart and get one for every room, and it's not a big deal. But you only have one TV in your house, so that was. A big deal to get that color TV, and we were the remote. Go oh, change the channel. Yeah, channel. We had to go change it. Also, for phones, they had party lines. That yes. would be like uh, the people across the street might have the same phone number that you do. So you pick up the phone and uh, you get an operator. Yeah. It'd be a, yeah. And uh, it, was, it was crazy. So and if you wanted to call someone in Hudson, you would just dial two. Yeah. Well, mine was two, mine was two three two before we had the the Jordan two. Yeah. So my so when my my grandfather worked for the phone company, and when um, they became Jordan yeah. five six two five six, and then um, he came home with some phone number, and my grandmother looked at him. She said, "Charlie, I can't remember that." Mm -hmm. So he went back and got a better number. So it was five six two 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 three two. And anybody wants to call me, I still have it. <laughs> you and you? Yeah, Aww. that's great. So, but it was for the longest time. You just pick up the phone and say, "Did you get two? Did you? Do we have to dial that? Was that a dial? I thought so. Yeah. Was it? Well, I'm We're ordering. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes. But so we didn't have operators ever. Oh, we did earlier. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was. Yeah, I think yeah. that's yeah. what. I guess it now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're going to switch gears here um, and talk about something that um, students in this room have studied quite a bit, and that's um, the war. Uh, Joey or Joe, can you ask me a question? Uh, so we did learn a lot about the, uh, the Vietnam War, and my question was, the protests against the Vietnam War was in 1969. What was the commonly held opinion of the war at the time? And were there any demonstrations? If so, did you participate? I did in college. That was that was more of a big thing in college. I went, I went to UMass and we had a big um, demonstration planned for May, but then they had the Kent State and people died. So we had the smartest governor of all, and he said, guess what, UMass? You're on vacation. Whatever you have for a grade today, you got for a grade. Go home. And so we didn't have a big demonstration at UMass and have that kind of a risk because uh, mm -hmm. Our government kind of took in hand what was going to happen, but it was a very dangerous time. Mm -hmm. I don't think we in Hudson maybe were affected as much. On a personal note, yeah. in 68 and 69, I had a brother serving in Vietnam. He did two tours over there, and we had a map of Vietnam on the dining room wall. And every time my parents got a letter from him, which was not often, they would put a pin. And of course, he was no longer in that area because it took months to get a letter. Um, he missed my junior prom and he missed my high school and graduation. It broke my heart, but he came home. He came home bitter. It took him a long time to recover. Pe he walked down the street and his uniform people would spit on him. Yeah. And that was in Hudson as well. Yeah. Um, the Vietnam War was just not an accepted war and those poor guys, they were just kids. As you could go downtown, we lost mm -hmm. two kids um, to the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. um, the T-ball boy that died, we were sophomores and his brother was a member of our class and then Dave Palmieri we I think we were out of school then when David died so Hudson did lose a couple um, but the Vietnam veterans were no way respect it was tough when they came home and yeah. it really was and some of them are still paying that price because they weren't accepted and it was not an accepted war and they were veterans that never really got the services a lot of them deserved right. and they didn't talk about it Never. No. You know, I mean, 
a lot of people in World War II didn't talk about it either for the reason that it was a war and it was awful, but you couldn't really share. Like, oh yeah, I was in Vietnam. People go, oh yeah, man, what was it like? You know, it wasn't like that. You just didn't bring it up. Should have never happened. Yeah, should have never happened. Right. As in so many Does that answer your question? It does. Um, let's uh, go after another question that sort of speaks to some of the other tumult going on in that era. Um, someone noticed that the yearbook was dedicated to RFK. And Mia Shaw, can you ask this question? Hi. Um, so we asked about. Well, I noticed in the yearbook there was a lot of um, pictures of Robert F. Kennedy and quotes. So we just wondered, um, how did you react when you found out about the assassination, and how did it impact you and other people? Well, we were practicing for the seniors' graduation. We were juniors when he died, and we used to hold the hoops, and they would walk through them, and that's when we found out that he died. I think we were more affected with JFK okay. than yeah, we yeah, were I with Robert. Um, I'm not really sure why they made the decision to dedicate our yearbook to him, um, but I think we all can tell you we were in the seventh grade, yep. and we got an announcement from Mr. Quinn. At that time, we went to Felton Street. It's where we went to seventh grade, and he just said to everybody, go straight home. They didn't yep. tell us why. They said, go straight home. But I was more affected with JFK than Robert. Well, I, was right. Right. Yeah. I was in Catholic yeah. school, and we were sent home. Mm -hmm. uh, that was awful. But also, we were part of a generation <coughs> where there was a lot of political uprising and tumult, and you had uh, Martin Luther King's assassination. We had that was in <coughs> April, right? And JFK was in June. Right. Yeah, it, it's like it became part of a regular turn on the television on the news and see what horrible thing had happened next. It was sad. Uh, I think JFK, <coughs> uh, RFK, he was kind of like a, a beacon of the next wave or somebody yes. we could get behind, and then he was gone. Yeah, that's that was my feeling about it. Like I, you know, there was there was hope. Yeah, here and was then hope, it went away, and then it was just gone. Yeah. And it was really there wasn't anybody else on the horizon that gave that same hope that right. they did. You know, I will say also, politically, um, I don't know how many of you have been to the JFK Library, but I went a number of years ago now, and they were running the um, Kennedy-Nixon debates. So Nixon, as you know, was really hated by us. <laughs> uh, but listening to them speak, I had tears, and uh, my wife Susie said, "What's the matter?" I said, "She says you're know, JFK." I'm like, "No." I said, "If Nixon ran now, I would vote for him." He was so left. He was so. He had so many really great ideas, but it, and it showed me that people at that time had a real plan for the country. They just didn't show up and say, "Okay, uh, this is what we're going to try to do." And then have nobody run. And him. call you a name, a, a horrible name. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, but it was it was so interesting because you know with with the passage of time, mm -hmm. some things are changed. I think language in itself was a big thing. It's like speeches were really well prepared. Your newspaper yeah. had things that were well prepared. We we didn't have a phone where we could just text or send an emoticon. It's we had to send letters. When we went home, we, when I was in college, we wrote letters to everybody. I still have some letters that were written that were that are pretty funny now. But uh, that was how we communicated because yeah. phones were super expensive. You never would pick up your phone and call long distance to anything, you know, unless someone died, then you call. But other than that, nope. You wrote a letter. Mm -hmm. uh, let's stay political here, and we uh, <laughs> might have a few things to say about. Uh, <laughs> Um, race and the struggle for rights. I mean, this can be sort of a broad question, not just in that necessarily about the struggle for African American rights, but um, you know, sort of like the other enterprises and movements that that opened up. Um, I don't know if I just asked the question, but Dan and Gabe, could you uh, sort of pose your thinking on that? Uh, it was really just a question um, fight for any of the sort of civil rights going on. You sort of mentioned the riots already. Um, did you join in at all? And why why not? And if not in high school, later on? Or? Well, 
<laughs> well, it shows how when you're younger and you're not informed of some current events, which I fell into that category, when I went to college in Boston, there was a protest, I mean, a, pro a protest for um, Charles Manson. He, they, and he is a horrible person, but at that time I didn't know that. My roommate said, come on, we're gonna march for uh, Charles Manson. I said, well, who is he? And they said, oh, he's a guy who got a bum rap. He, they put him in jail and he didn't deserve it. And all, and I, so I said, okay. And so I went with them and I'm down the streets of Boston, free Charles Manson. And, and my mother, is, she sees me on the six o'clock noon. <laughs> I'm like, and, and I had no, I swear to God, I had no idea who the guy was. So we're so, um, I, what's the word I'm it was for? a smaller world. It was a smaller world. I had no idea. And so you just have to really be informed, more than I was, uh, of what really is what's going on. But that's the only thing I can say I did, and it was horrible that I did. But, but. In 69, the Stonewall riots in New York uh, happened. And that was, I mean, there'd been a gay and lesb lesbian movement forever, but that was a turning point for the, uh, the sexual rights that were to come, what, last week? <laughs> Later. <laughs> you know, but it, it took a long time, but that was the, the turning point where people stood up and they said, okay, no more, we're going to march, we're going to do this, we're going to move on. What, what year was that? So, what year was Stonewall? 69. In the summer, I think. At, at your age, were you even aware that that happened, or was that something that... I was aware of it probably the year after. Yeah, no. <coughs> I was, but I did go to Woodstock. <laughs> and you know, and I think about it, I was 17. I mean, this is, like, when I say, oh, at 10 I could ride my bike, I was 17. I didn't even turn 18 until September. And I said to my mother, you know, there's this thing going to happen. I think it's going to be really cool. It's a lot of music, a lot of good bands. I got a ride. I'm going to go. She's like, hmm. I, mm. I was like, I'm going to go. Like, okay. All right, then. So I went. It was fabulous. And, uh, you know, it, but it was, it was the kind of thing where people would just pick up and travel across forever to just go to this one thing. Which you know, you could hitchhike back then too. Oh, you could yeah. hitchhike back. Hitchhike, oh, yeah. Yeah. we did. We yeah. hitchhiked. I hitchhiked right up until I didn't anymore. I got a <laughs> couple of bad rides, but uh, <laughs> but it was you know you could hitchhike. Yeah. At UMass, that's why most people went home. They, yeah, yeah. Put their thumb out. We did. So could you guys talk? Um, let's go with that a little bit. Talk a little. I think. People probably would want to know a little bit about Woodstock, Lauren, if you don't mind. And then maybe a little bit We're more about... We're all naked. The, <laughs> <laughs> the music you were into. The names of the change to protect the innocent. Yeah. <laughs> but you can watch the movie. Um, the first concert I ever went to see was the Beatles. My girlfriend who lived up by you, Gail Stacy, yep. somehow got tickets. And, and again, her dad drove us into Boston. It was at uh, the Garden, and he just let us out. I was 13. I, you know, it was October, so I was 13. I just turned 13. He let the two of us out into a screaming mass of young women, and you know, screaming at the top of their lungs. It just, and, but it was great. It was fun. So, and then what was the music? The Doors. The. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, Rolling Stones, I love it. Yeah, the Rolling Stones. Stones. I like yes. Jimmy, Jimmy Hendrix. Jimmy Hendrix played in Framingham. I saw him in a tent in Framingham. <laughs> oh, it's crazy. This was like, a, a, of all the things that put a, a wall between you and your parents, it was the music. You know, it's like if you yes. had the music playing loud, if you, if, believe me, Jimmy Hendrix in my house, that wasn't going to fly. So it's like it had to be when they weren't around. <laughs> yeah, a lot of happened. Yeah, Probably a lot of things happen when they were Can you just give us one Woodstock anecdote? A Woodstock Harper anecdote. Oh, it rained. So there was a lot of mud. And I had, you know, I just looked across the street. I had a tent that I don't know where it came from. It was canvas. Girl green. Scout. 
I, and I had it before Girl Scouts, and it and it smelled like waxed cotton. And so I, I said to my boyfriend David, "Hey, I got a tent. Come on, we're gonna go." So we took the thing. We had the tent. We get there. We put the tent up, and I hadn't used it in a number of years. And the whole the ridge pole went right through <laughs> the top of the tent. So I left it with stuff. And it uh, and it was leaking. You know, we had sleeping bags. We kept pulling the bottom up more and more. But it was I went and I found my friends. I don't know how I did that. I found my my friend Irene had just had a baby who is turning 50 this year, and. Um, she had her in July, and in August, she was a good start with this little baby. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it was, the music was great. When I left Woodstock at the end of the days, uh, because there was music going on all the time, so you could be listening to music, or you could wander off and go swimming with other people, or you could make new friends, you could just dance, whatever. And But when I left, Jimi Hendrix was playing um, the Star Spangled Banner as we were leaving. You could hear it from out. Good. That's awesome. <laughs> so I guess my one of my things that I want to tell you is don't ever put anything in writing. It's probably a little late for that, but that was a good thing my mother taught me. And then always take an opportunity. Try always to say yes yep. unless it's unless it's bad, unless you, you have a bad <laughs> feeling. But you know, because time passes and you don't get that back. Yep. You don't get those, you don't get the, the other chance, you know, I'll do that later. You know, you don't always get yeah. that. Try stuff. And the other thing is, I used to read all the time, I still read all the time, but it never occurred to me that I could write to an author or call an author or track down an author and see if they wanted to go to lunch. You know, what? there are so many people that are on the planet that I can look back now and I'll say, oh my God, that person was alive and living in Boston at that time. Why didn't I go and try to reach out, you know, it's, be aware of what's happening in your world, because it's important. Mm -hmm. hey, we've covered a lot of it on the slides here. Maybe just one more slide, and then we'll take some questions from the audience. Um, we don't know who Chandler Stevens is. A bunch of questions <laughs> came up about uh, something that's kind of obvious, going to the moon. Who asked this question? Uh, Dylan, not here. Go ahead, Dylan. Um, so we learned about like the mission to the moon, like flying up there, the landing of Armstrong. And I just want to know, like, what was going on around that time? Like, did you watch the mission and the landing? And how? What was like the talk about it? Well, that was right after we graduated. Graduated. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That was fake, you know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> She was still in New York. <laughs> but you can. It was it was awesome. I mean, you know, you just. But then you know, it got old hat. I remember being at UMass when someone landed on the moon, and I didn't know about it for a while because I didn't have a television. I didn't wasn't really plugged into anything. <laughs> so I was like, oh yeah, somebody walked on the moon. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> It was amazing. It was. That first one was like crazy. It was just so surreal. Yeah. And they sent them there with slide rules. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Do you know from slide rules? Did we hear of a slide rule? It was pre-calculator. When I went to UMass, if you bought a, a Texas Instrument calculator, it cost you $400 in that money. And it really did what things you can get at the dollar store now. It wasn't a graphing calculator. So uh, slide rules were what everybody who was in the sciences had. It looked like a ruler with a little slide in it. And you can, it didn't give you decimal points. You had to kind of figure out where the decimal point went. And I loved my slide rule. It was nice. I don't know what ever happened to it. <laughs> Yeah, I don't have money anymore. You didn't have anything to say. I don't know. I think we had to have one in I still have an avenue. <laughs> <laughs> I still have a chisel of the rock. <laughs> let's take a couple questions uh, that might have just come up from anything you heard or um, <laughs> uh, anything you thought of from teachers or students. So, so I think something that came up with my students in class a lot was like, well, what did you guys do socially in high school? Like, where'd you hang out in town? What was what were the places to go? 
Do they still exist? The main street. The wall in front of the church on Main Street. Yeah, that was until the cops came church. and told you to move yeah. along. The wall was really important. And sit the on the wall. wall. And then if somebody had a car, they would drive up and down the main street. Up to the rotary. Yeah. 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 The whole thing the main. And then there was Dagwoods. Dagwoods, yes. They had French fries with French fries with French fries with gravy. So we would hang out there. There were a lot of great places to eat. There were um, there were fun places to go, and they had dances. So when we were in junior high, they had dances in the basement of St. Luke's, and we would go down there, and we'd go to the dance. Now, picture we're twelve and thirteen, um, and and it's a small space. If you've ever been down there, we would sneak out the door we came in. We'd go over and kiss boys over in the yeah. buses behind the junior high, or we'd go down to the footbridge, and then we just had to be back by the time the dance was over. You know, and so, so it was, and then they had dances at the town hall, and those were great. There were live bands, they were upstairs in the town hall. Sometimes people would come from out of town that could actually really dance, and they'd have moves and stuff. It was good, and we had, we had to take ballroom dancing when we were. In seventh grade, you know, Jean, which I think Miss Jean, we are. and we had to wear dresses and walk across the room, and somebody come, some boy come over and ask you to dance, and then you had to do the foxtrot and the walls. And on that, so from my perspective, the boys were on one side, the girls were on the other, sitting in the chairs, and uh, when Ladies' Choice came up. Every all the boys try to bolt to the bathroom. Only one bathroom. We also had a movie theater in Hudson too. Yes, yeah. Hope Street. Yeah. That was it was like a quarter or something. Yeah. So that's where the and they see two movies. Yeah, I see two movies. My mom. So we had that too. I say to my mother, "Can you go to the, the movies?" And my mother say, "No." And then my grandma say, "Go get my mom and we'll do it." And then I get to go to the movies. Yes. Um, I feel like, like, like nowadays people like they sit at home more and they kind of just like go on the internet and stuff. Mm. And like back then, people had like more memories and like they're more action oriented and they would like do more stuff. I, do you guys like agree? Like, yes. Like you guys did more than us. We had yeah. to because if you stay home, your parents would think up some chore for you to do. <laughs> so you know, it's like I'm going out. And uh, that was like freedom, and you yeah. had to find somebody. What are you going to do? Walk around by yourself all day? So you find somebody to hang out with. And not talk to each other. And then, but there were kids outside. Like, I have a son who's 39, and I have a daughter who's 14 and a half. And David went out a lot. Aurora never goes out. It's like, go, honey, go out on the trampoline. No, I don't want to. No, I'm going to, you know, just like this. All the time. It's, you know, it's a. It's a hard thing because you don't you don't get out there, you don't have some wild adventure, you don't you know, I'm addicted to this, clearly, but I still go outside. You know, but you you can drive around town, you don't see kids playing outside. You don't see kids on the lawn. You know, I would take my dolls out on the lawn and play with my dolls on the lawn when I was little. You just don't see that. You know, you don't see kids. You, know, you might see somebody on their bikes, a couple of boys maybe, but it's not, and there's more traffic. There's a lot more traffic than there was. I, I would be reticent to send anybody out on a bicycle now. But yeah, I feel like we did have, you know, and the other thing is, we had to hold on to our memories because we didn't have cameras. I mean, we had cameras, but we didn't use them a lot because that was expensive. And we didn't have phones. You know, we just had to remember, which is I know. I was always outside. I never. I rode my bike. I jogged. I did ice skating. I did roller skating. So I was always involved with those kind of sports. I wasn't on the basketball team in the high school, but I had my sports that I did um, on my own individually. And so I was gone all the time doing those things. Never ever was I in the house. And even now, when people talk about certain television shows and they say, "Oh, remember that?" Blah, blah, I have no memory of that at all because I never watched television ever. I was always out. I was so active. Jack, go ahead. 
Uh, back to the idea of the Stonewall Uprising, like, what was the view on like homosexuality at the time, and were any people like out? Well, I told a funny story that's really not that funny, but it's, it's kind of funny. <laughs> so, this girl that we went to high school with, Christine, had a boyfriend, Davey, oh, the son of Mr. Quinn. And so, we would go, we'd be out wandering around, and then we'd go back to Christine's house, because she lived on Central Street, so she was centrally located. <laughs> so, um, one day we walk into the house, and Christine says to her mother, Hey, you want to see how Davey kisses me? And then she grabs me and gives me this big smooch. And her mother's like, <gasps> and the two of us are like, huh? I guess she doesn't want you kissing Davy. You know? <laughs> we went upstairs. We were clueless. I had no idea what a lesbian was. We didn't. I didn't know from gay. There was, you know, and and it's like a twofold thing because the two women who lived across the street from me were lesbians. I grew up with them, and one of them just just like a guy, Ivy. Always, you know, she always had really short hair. I share it. Guy pants, Teresa was always in a dress. You know, so, and they were, they were out in our neighborhood because how could you not be really? But it wasn't, I, you know, I don't know. I know there were kids, there were boys in our class that were clearly gay, that were bullied. Mm -hmm. I know that. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, you know, I didn't have a clear picture until later. So I didn't really know uh, you know, I can't say how it was viewed on a larger scale because I, you know, I barely knew it existed. It wasn't until I got to college that I was really aware, and, and people that I met at college started coming out. They, people didn't come out very early. You know, it was like people came out maybe a few years later or into college, you know, so, you know, my first college boyfriend ended up being gay, you know, so. <laughs> well. Who else has a question? Uh, yeah, in the car after that. Oh. Right. Uh, you guys happen to remember each other from high school? Oh yeah, yeah. I was definitely. Oh, totally. Well. Yeah. It wasn't a very big class. It was, it was, it was a little class. 155. 155 kids. So, then what are you guys? 180? No. <laughs> <laughs> There are little groups like who you went to elementary school with, and so they, there's memories that form that way. So when you did get to the high school, there was a group of people that you knew. Yes. I'm sorry, I pointed to one, you pointed to the other. <laughs> no, you go ahead. Okay. Um, you guys mentioned um, relationships at a young age often, and you also talked about um, your friend who had a baby. Were teen pregnancy something that was common at that time? It wasn't, it wasn't common, common, but no. we, we did have a classmate when we were sophomores yep. that, that she that she had, had to leave school. They leave school. They have to leave school. They couldn't stay in school. And she, there were three she girls that I could get. It's called I'm Jane. Yeah. yeah. And oh. she's still yeah. happily married. Beverly. <laughs> I love Beverly. Yeah. And then we had a couple that got got married. And yeah. they're still married. They got married when we were juniors and they're still married to this day. Um so th yeah. there were teen pregnancies. Um, and it was pre birth control pill, so there wasn't a whole lot no, of it people wasn't. could do. The birth control pill came out. I looked it up. It came out in 1960. Yes, and it was it was more available to other people. But I think the I think birth control, the pill, yep. more than any other thing, I agree, uh, changed the 60s because yep. it gave women so much freedom. It gave them freedom to have a career because they didn't have to have babies. They could commit to you know working for yeah. these number of years or. It, it really, uh, and it gave them a sexual freedom that they didn't have before. It could uh, allow people to invest in women's sports because mm -hmm. that was a big part of women's, you know, we can't afford them, they might get pregnant. Yeah. So it, it, yeah, I think that that, but it wasn't, I think I got birth control in 69 after we graduated, but it wasn't was until 70. around then that, um, I, I don't think I knew anybody in high school that had it. It wasn't really, it, right after we left, I think, is when it became more uh, prescribed. Originally, it was like prescribed to married women. You know. Really? We might have a question, uh, room for one more, two more questions, maybe? Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, what was the role of the uh, progressive movement in, 
on an international scale on more suburban life, like in Hudson. So like the various revolutions that went on in the 60s, did they have an effect on your everyday lifestyle? Or the Not in the 60s. I don't think. Did they? I think in the 60s, the biggest thing for us is that suburbs were a new new concept. It was like, our, so my father grew up on a farm, my mother in Boston. This is a whole brand new thing. So they were inventing it too as we were going along. And I saw it within our family, like my mother didn't drive and then she got her license. So things changed as uh, the world started to turn and had more opportunities. Anybody else? <coughs> Mr. Reinhardt or Ms. McMurray? Sorry, go ahead. Uh, sorry, Kat, you asked one right next to you. Uh, um, what was your first car and why did you like it so much? That 62 Corvair. And I didn't love it because it had dual carburetors that never were in sync. So when it was a cold day, I had to stand in the back and open the choke while my husband went out and uh, impressed the gas pedal. He's not mechanical. So it left it to me to open the chokes in the cold. Mine was a 51 Cadillac. And it was my, it was my mother and father's car and it got passed down to me. And I just loved that car because I could fit, and we didn't have to have seatbelts, I could fit 20 people in that car. <laughs> <laughs> and we would ride up and down the main yep. street and be yelling out the window. If so I just with love that car. And if you ever got in an accident in it, it was like, a ste of like one of those great big tanks. Tank. It was so yeah. safe. It, even though we didn't have a seatbelt. <coughs> we didn't have to wear a seatbelt. But that was unbelievable. My parents had an Oldsmobile Jetstar 88 that was very similar to that. Uh, you could hit things and it never made it. <laughs> I know. How about you, Debbie? Uh, well, I, I ended up getting my older brother's uh, VW uh, uh, Volkswagen. And uh, it was great for High Street because you could, you would, the key wouldn't start the uh, car. You had to roll it down. <laughs> or after basketball, baseball practice or basketball practice, someone, a couple guys who wanted to ride would have to push me yep. a little first and yes. then hop in. But that was that was part of it too. They, rust wasn't an issue. No. You could have as much rust as you wanted. Right. We had old cars. Like I had my mother's 1964 Ford Falcon which was this little square thing, it was black, and had red interior. My grandfather had originally bought it, and he was like, you don't need any extras on a car. No radio, nothing, roll up windows. nothing. Roll up windows. <laughs> roll up windows. <laughs> Although they used, to be, they, used to be, they used to be vent windows. Have you guys ever seen oh, vent yeah, windows? Windows. So there would be the, the window, then there'd be a little triangle here, and you could flip it, and you could turn it, because there was no air conditioning, so you would turn it and the wind would so just blow car. right on yes. you. It was so good. Right. I missed that. But, um, yeah, but that was mine. And my mother, for me to get that, my mother paid uh, $1,800 cash for a green Volkswagen bug. What did you drive? My brother's 1966 Pontiac Le Mans when he was in Vietnam. Oh, nice. I got, I got to have it, but I had to give back when he came home. That was nice. <laughs> It was really nice. <laughs> yeah. My Corvair rusted out, uh, the floor rusted out. So if I picked up the mat, I could see the street going. <laughs> <laughs> it was like the Flintstones, you know? And, uh, just, and if you went through a puddle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, you'd get wet. I'd have to put a mat there so, so that I didn't accidentally lose a foot. You got you where you wanted to go though, right? You know, it, yeah, I was so thrilled to have it. It, it, it was an exciting thing to have a car. I have just a quick question. What was like the spot to hang out in Hudson, like after school and stuff? Like, the was wall. That like downtown. Downtown. Does everybody know where the wall is? No. no. Explain. They, they do know it's where the wall is. It's in front of the, the Unitarian uh, Church. The Unitarian Church. By the, church. the white hall. church on Main oh, Street. By the town hall. Oh. Beautifully situated. And then some of the kids hung out at the sand pits because that's where they could drink. <laughs> and where were the sand pits? I was a latchkey kid, so after school I had to go home and let my siblings in. I didn't go there. Pool <laughs> room on uh, South Street. Right, yeah. The pool room. Girls, I didn't go there. Girls, because she was a woman. No. no. <laughs> oh, no. 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 no.
Again, no girl nods. All right, we have time for one more question. Ms. McMurray actually is going to steal the floor, and then we're going to um, wrap it up and thank our guests. So I'm wondering, um, in your opinion, what would be the single best change to Hudson that exists today that didn't exist when you were growing up? Um, and what do you think is the biggest sort of negative that's come that I think one of the biggest changes for you guys is the opportunity of courses that you have to take, whether it's AP or I know when my daughter was here, and I'm assuming it still goes, when you were seniors, you could go like to Holy Cross and take a college course. I mean, that has opened so much up education-wise for you guys. I think the, uh, that choice is wonderful. That's a hard question. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's why. I was getting a little bit nervous because there's a teacher asking me questions. Um, it's been a while. Um, I think that Hudson is part of like the broader world now. It's not like when we were in Hudson, it had its own identity. And it was definitely different from Marlboro's identity, which was very different. And uh, so you had your Hudson and you had your Marlboro and it kind of didn't meet. And you guys are all so connected. You have the connections to everything. You're connected to the broader world. We didn't have that. We, mm -hmm. we had each other. And that was pretty much the limit of it. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to have to actually pause there. Yes. Although you could probably go on about this if you even thought more about it. Um, you've just given us uh, like a really several vivid, vivid uh, windows um, and ways to think about nightlife about 50 years ago. So thank you so much for that. So,